Thanks so much. It's so wonderful to be back with you after all these years. We had a, a wonderful reunion with lots of pictures on Friday night. All these years, you've been in my heart as my first church, sometimes with nostalgia for simpler life and sometimes with chagrin at all the missteps and clumsy moves I made as I learned my trade and lived through my young adulthood with you. You were so patient and kind and wise with that young minister. Those were really good years for me. Here in Albuquerque, I studied Kung Fu and Tai Chi for some years. And finding a school that was open to older students, not to mention women students, was difficult. The Sifu in the school I finally found was a retired Marine and ran a concealed gun uh, carry school and gun use school when martial arts wasn't in session. It wasn't an entirely um, comfortable situation for me, but, um, but I found it very educational. We never talked politics, but it was a very conservative in the sense of father knows best environment. Sifu David waged an impressive campaign with every child who came into the school to get them in the habit of saying yes sir and yes ma'am when speaking to the teachers. At least that's what I thought the rule was. About three months in, I overheard him remarking to a newer adult that while he knew that in some schools, the use of sir and ma'am was not required when addressing the teachers, it was in this school and would he please get into the habit. This was something he had never said to me. And it was the first time it had crossed my mind that an adult was supposed to address another adult in such a formal way. I was embarrassed to have been so ignorant. But that's the way it is with culture. We are so embedded in ours that we can be tone deaf to others. If we don't even really realize that we are embedded in a culture, we are even more tone deaf. My teacher was aware from the moment I introduced myself as the minister from the Unitarian Church down the street that I was coming from a liberal creative culture. And at some level, I had noticed that he was treating this gingerly. And I was too, I was trying to fit in, but I missed a major piece of it. The outward show of title and respect that's important in many conservative cultures and most uniformed cultures. Culture tells us lots and lots of things. Who is to be respected and why and how. It tells us whose dignity is protected, what roles are appropriate for men and women, boys and girls, whose voice is heard most clearly, who is in and who is out and how the outs are treated, how conflict is managed, what language is acceptable, how time is understood and dealt with, what counts as disgusting and wonderful, what an acceptable breakfast is, among many, many other things. The culture war that began in the 1980s between conservatives and liberals was mostly played out in realms of sex and gender. Women's rights, women's roles, abortion, then gay rights, then transgender recognition and inclusion, they've all seen significant progress in our view and really at Disney, dizzying speeds. That culture well, war went well for liberals. It's not one though, and it's not over. But what I want to talk about today is another set of aspects of culture, which have been in the press lately. They've taken different names, like cancel culture and call out culture. There is considerable pressure, especially from younger people and people who've experienced social discrimination for the liberal culture we you use are part of to pay attention to the pain of discrimination and how the norms of the dominant culture disadvantage those who are trying to address injustice. There's been a lot of resistance and discomfort to these new cultural expressions, mostly among conservatives, but also among liberals who generally say that they agree with the goals, but that what is being asked goes against another cultural value, which is more important, that of free speech. And that's what we're going to take a look at for the next 15 minutes or so. The first step at looking at this is to acknowledge that we live within a culture, one among many possible cultures. 
We can't decide whether it would be good to tweak that culture if we unconsciously believe that it's the only way it is. We're embedded so deeply in this culture that most of us don't even realize it has a name, but it does, dignity culture. To understand that more easily, let's look first at the culture it replaced in the Western world between 100 and 200 years ago, a different way to organize a society, which was called the honor culture. There are two icons of honor culture, which you will recognize the duel the fight to the death by two men who believe that a man's honor is more important than his life, and the loud slap in the face that a woman who's being dishonored by a man's sexual harassment uses to bring him back to his senses and bring an honorable man to her aid. Got those pictures? They're both very old fashioned. In an honor culture, the amount of honor a person has the respect they can command, the tasks they can pursue, their very place in society is both assigned at one's birth and maintained by one's faithful upholding of the mores of one's place. In other words, you have to maintain your honor through your own actions by being, for instance, a man of your word, by being a faithful provider for your family. You also have to defend your honor with the help of your family and friends if it's impugned usually verbally. Them's fighting words is a warning of an honor culture. It's hard for those of us from other cultures to take this seriously. We've been taught not to take it seriously. So we're shocked to our cores to see Alexander Hamilton give his son his best set of dueling pistols when the son's honor was impugned. Honor cultures take insults very seriously. Urban gangs to this day often function in an honor culture. Insult a gang member and he and his friends will fight you and your friends because honor is critical. The enlightenment, enlightenment began changing the honor culture slowly, establishing what we now call the dignity culture. In the dignity culture, every human being has dignity and that is the important human trait we don't need to protect it individually because it is, as one famous declaration goes, inalienable. One's dignity and therefore one's human rights come with one's birth, not because we are good or upper class or educated or it was eventually seen, not because we are white or male or property owning. They come because we are alive. We have these rights because we are human. Dignity culture is baked into America's founding documents and laws. Unitarian Universalism is a child of that same ethos. You find these words in our UU principles, the worth and dignity of every human being. This way of looking at human beings gives human beings a fundamental equality and dignity, regardless of what they do. They can be a danger to society and have to be incarcerated, perhaps even executed, but ideally this punishment will fall short of violating their fundamental human dignity. I don't think we do very well here, but there is a reason that we don't, for instance, parade a heinous killer naked through the streets. Even when they've transgressed, even when they have violated the dignity of others, they are still seen to be allowed some dignity for themselves. In a dignity culture, you don't have to defend your dignity against slights and insults. If the offense against you is large, you will apply to law enforcement and to the courts. If it's small, you're encouraged to ignore it. To fight for one's dignity is to leave a whiff of uncertainty about it. The dignified thing to do is to walk away. Sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you, you were taught. Not that you actually ever believed that. Even though there's not a person over the age of four who has not been deeply wounded by words, we learn to hide that fact from all but our loved ones and carry on in public. The alternative is seen to be barbaric, duels, honor killings, gang warfare. So while there's not a one of us who doesn't know perfectly well that words can too hurt us, in public at least, it would be beneath our dignity to object. 
When President-elect Biden first named his choice of vice president, many people who should have taken the trouble to do a little research, and I count myself amongst those, mispronounced her name until they learned better. And many conservatives not only mispronounced it, but mocked it and shrugged off their scornful behavior as unimportant. Kamala herself just kept on walking as she had all her life. However, vociferous objections were made on her behalf by those who were expressing a new cultural norm, sometimes called the call-out culture. In call-out culture, you object aloud when you're insulted or when someone is insulted around you, a new move deeply uncomfortable to those of us who are steeped, and we all are, in a dignity culture. Call-out culture aims to end the speech of those who scorn and denigrate others, especially the others who are on the outside of culture and therefore subject to this sort of thing a lot. Those who object to this newfangled idea hold up the norms of dignity culture and especially the norm that nothing is more important than freedom. What's most valued in a dignity culture? Human freedom. To believe, to say, to write, to do things that don't directly and significantly harm others. The free mind, which brings new ideas, new knowledge, and significantly new wealth into the world is understood to be of ultimate value. And because freedom brings us such bounty, free speech, free association, freedom of religion, and even a free press are nearly unquestioned goods among us. And even when some of these things seem to do harm, that's seen as an unfortunate but necessary trade-off. We do agree that there is need for some constraints on, say, free speech when the harm is immediate and visible. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater, as you say. Many people would say that egging on an armed and crazed mob to storm an occupied building is beyond tolerance too, but not all. We'll soon see how that plays out. This year has pre presented many challenges to the dignity culture's unspoken assumptions that people are generally rational, that the best ideas will eventually win out, and that words can have real and harmful consequences, and not just to our tender psyches, but to our, the very fundamentals of our governance. More and more in the past decade, people who are subject to repeated abuse by the words and actions of others are speaking out to complain about it, which is an offense against dignity culture. They're saying that it's simply not true that words can't hurt you, especially when they're frequent and come from many directions. They're saying that they need to constantly fend off insults, counter wrong information, suffer being interrupted in conversation, read threats on social media, and generally defend their rights to be in the room. And that takes a toll on their human dignity, which has been ignored by those privileged enough to not experience it. The term for this kind of harm is microaggressions. Not all of them involve speech. Some involve gestures, sounds, touches, body language that scorns or denigrates another person, not to mention written words and posted photographs and habits like interrupting. But free speech has such axiomatic support in our culture and especially in our liberal culture that threats against free speech garner outrage. As a woman, I've experienced plenty of this in my life, especially coming into what was then a male profession as a young woman. A couple of summers before I came to Columbia, I was in a training program for chaplains where I was the target of a barrage of microaggressions and bullying from several of the men in the program who did not believe that women should be ordained or be chaplains. No one interaction was particularly awful Nothing I felt that I could complain about, but the repetition, it was bad. They saved most, but not all of their vitriol for times and places when the faculty wasn't present. So it took 10 weeks of the 11 week program for anybody to notice and do something about it. But the damage to me, it was done. I found when I returned to seminary, a seminary where I had found nothing but welcome for women students, that I just didn't feel like speaking up in classes anymore, so I kept my head and my hand down. I heard later that the professors in the small department were asking themselves what had happened to me. 
once I began my ministry, I realized I'd really missed most of the learning about caring in a hospital setting that from that summer program. It's supposed to produce that kind of learning. And I felt like I had to retake the unit, which I did at the Baptist Hospital there in Columbia one year. Those words did hurt me. So I totally get how important it is to notice and respond even to the small things that happen to me and those around me. Call-out culture is not so much a new culture as it is a set of tactics that work better than the tools offered by the dignity culture to deal with microaggressions. That barrage of pinpricks disguised as jokes, poor choices of words or mistakes, accidental touches, rolled eyes, minor trolling, each very small, that's the micro part, but together over a day, a career, a lifetime, a terrible burden. That's the aggressive part. A burden that leaves victims less able to contribute and more exhausted when they do. And because of that, less well compensated, more susceptible to illness, more stressed out than optimal for one's work or family life, and on it goes. Call-out culture involves everything from objecting to an instance of being denigrated or interrupted or winked at or touched right then and there and loudly, to pressuring social media corporations to pay more attention to the harm that allowing unfettered free speech is doing to persons and society. Its sister, what's being called cancel culture, involves the cancellation of speakers, the taking down of symbols, and the removing events in institutional settings like colleges and workplaces, which have microaggressions as their subtext. Provocative speakers, the Confederate flag, the nooses, just to name a few. Cancel culture advocates a practice of just writing off and refusing to relate to those who transgress the dignity of others in these ways. Cancel culture is also subject to scorn among conservatives and fear and worry, even among some of us. There is, for instance, a three-year-old controversy going on in our own UUA of this nature, which just won't go away. In my opinion, this new culture we're being told is threatening our dignity culture is really not all that threatening. And it's not really a new culture, but rather a set of tactics that refines the insights of dignity culture and brings more people into its blessings. It's uncomfortable, it's raw, it can be clumsy, it can and will be misused. But I think that we will all be better off and our democratic society will be better off when we acknowledge and understand that words really can hurt us. If we do that, then we can turn to protecting the kinds of speech that actually do bring good into our society. And maybe, just maybe, a few years from now, our society will be a little further along in realizing the purposes for which Unitarian Universalism stands, a world where everyone's dignity is honored, where justice and compassion and peace are more fundamentally a part of our lives. So let's sing about that. Oh, thank you, Christine.